if we, were, we were talking about the odd couple. I just wanted to mention a few of the uh, more famous episodes of the program, if you have any stories about them. And the first one is The Odd Monks, which you also wrote. Yeah, The Odd Monks was a special uh, episode of Odd Couple because I think the key to a show is you, you have to adjust some time to what the actors are going through. You can't just say, do it then, baby. It doesn't work like that. There's a, you got to understand the, the process. And there's a thing after a while where the actors get a little tired of this such long and complicated scripts and we're feeling our oats and suddenly they were getting down on the writers and the writers were yelling at them. So that's why I, on all my shows, would then write a show that had very little dialogue. Either I have a show where it has mostly music or, you know, they don't talk. And The Odd Monks was written so there would be no dialogue. Tony and Jack went away to a monastery, a retreat, and they, they took a vow of silence and they didn't talk for 40 pages. That was the show. And uh, it worked out great because they didn't have to memorize anything. And it was a very, I think, a very good show. Um, I, uh, I like to adjust and challenge the actors. It also is a challenge to them to shut up a minute. And uh, I, it was pretty funny. It was also my Lucy training to try to write visual and physical without uh, verbal words all the time. Just to vary it. There's nothing wrong. We love the words. But you have to vary a show if it's on every week and surprise the audience occasionally. But that was one of my favorites. Another one was Password. Password was just a lucky show. Uh, you think you go through this great creative process. Sometimes it's all what I call cocktail parties and lunch. An actor or myself goes out to a lunch or some party and you run into somebody and you say, hey, maybe it'd be fun you come on the show. That's what happened. Tony Randall was out and he met Alan Ludden and Betty White or something and said, come on, you'll be on the show. And so we wrote a special episode for them Password. Frank Buxton, I think he wrote it, directed or something, and it was a great episode. And uh, Tony was just so funny on that show. Uh, he was playing a, a brilliant mind, and that's why he plays so well. Did you have a favorite episode of the series? Of odd, my favorite episode of Odd Couple. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, I would say that uh, Odd Monks was one, and then one written by uh, Dale McRaven about a a bird, a parrot that, that died, they couldn't save the parrot. Odd Couple originally started as a one-camera show, and uh, Tony and Jack hated the laugh track, so we made a big campaign. See, you can do things in this business if you wanted. No, no, we're having laugh tracks, that's what the network said. But then Tony went on The Tonight Show and said, please, ladies and gentlemen, write letters to The Odd Couple and say you hate the laugh track because we hate it and we don't want it. So if you write a letter, we'll get an audience like the other shows have. And the people wrote and we got the, uh, the audience so that it became a, um, I thought a much better show because we had that uh, audience as the referee with the Jack and Tony. I told you, I always liked the audience. But there were a lot of uh, uh, shows, the, uh, the show, I guess one of the shows I liked the best was in the army, where he was in the army and he married. Jack got married, uh, and uh, my daughter was in the show. It, it it ended her acting career. She became a writer after that. She was uh, eight or something, and uh, I needed some child that could play the piano badly, and my daughter played badly. We tried everything. She was not going to be a piano player, but we put her in anyway to play the wedding march badly. And she did it quite well, and, uh, but the actors were yelling, and Tony, I think, pinched her arm because he was jumping around, and she didn't want to act ever again, and she didn't. She retired, became a writer. She became the journalist I'd ever become. She got her master's from Northwestern and has written for many, many publications. But that's a personal thing. I would say The Odd Monks was one of the, uh, the funniest, and then the, um, the one where we were experimenting again, inventing a new wheel, trying to combine the three camera technique of filming on a stage with the one camera technique of filming like a movie. And a lot of times you do the opening titles and that's it. But we did a show called The New Car or something 
in which we literally did back, I directed it myself, back and forth between the car, out in the street, and all this live New York City stuff. Not only did we do it outside, we did it in New York already. And uh, it was really, I, I don't think it was the finest piece of work ever done, but it really showed you could do that. And uh, a lot of shows did it. I, I think uh, uh, Seinfeld started to do that later in their years, too. But it, we, we were one of the first ones to really combine the two together. And without, you see, they, they felt the audience would miss the other part, the live audience. But we told them what happened. And then we showed them the clips of it. You know, we didn't, they got it. They were happy. And uh, some of it was funnier. So that was one of my... <clears throat> famous odd couple, uh, just for the experimental purposes. And uh, I guess Gene Simmons uh, came on and played a princess. And uh, since uh, I was trying to find my voice and what my work was going to be and try this, try that, try the other thing. And uh, I remember that episode proved to me that what I really liked to do a lot was romantic love stories where it was pretty. And uh, that was a successful episode. And uh, I did a lot of princess stuff after that. Uh, as we speak, I'm doing Princess Diaries. But that love story with the, uh, the, um, the caste system, the rich girl and the poor boy, the rich boy and the poor girl, uh, I liked that. Uh, Kind of, I guess I was a poor boy and I married a poorer girl, so that story don't work well together. But uh, I think that was one of my favorites. Now, was Neil Simon involved in the series at all? Well, Neil, <clears throat> Neil Simon's story is a good anecdote that, uh, <clears throat> like life, sometimes a deal is made and not everybody's happy. They. Neil Simon did not have a good deal on the Odd Couple television series because he never thought it would ever become a series. Who thought? He wrote a play, he wanted it to be a movie. In those days, there was not any big precedent of it doing anything like being a television show. So he, he didn't have a good deal, and so he was upset that Paramount wouldn't give him any more money when it became a successful series. So he, he badmouthed the show in a sense of, he said, I don't watch it. You know, it's not his own show. And... Uh, but again, like I'd say, in life, it turns around, and by sheer luck, his children started to watch it. And his children said, Daddy, you know, it's a nice show. And he started to watch it, and he started to love it, and he called us up, and he came and made an appearance on the show. And uh, we were so startled, because he was like our idol, Neil Simon. And when he came on the show, he quoted lines from all our scripts, and it was just terrific. So uh, he grew to uh, like it, and uh, it was a personal thing. It didn't have anything to do with our work. Well, it usually is a personal thing. If it's, uh, remember on Dick Van Dyke, Mary Tyler Moore, we came in one day, took our script that we wrote, and threw it against the wall, so the brads broke, and all the paper floated to the ground. And we said, it's that bad, that script? Turns out she had stopped smoking that day was a little withdrawal, <laughs> but apologized later. So you never know. Do you remember what script it was? I think it was the one where, where uh, she was uh, home alone with, uh, with Millie. I think it was the Cairns one, because uh, we had done, again, we were inventing a new wheel. We said, you know, let's try something nobody would try. So we wrote a script in which we wanted Dick Van Dyke just to stay on the stage alone. That's it, just do, no interacting. So he had this idea, because I was home once. My wife went, the kids, I was home all alone. I didn't know what to do with myself. So we wrote an episode literally where Dick Van Dyke was on the stage alone for 17 pages. That it was only him he was making phone calls and doing like that, and it came out a pretty good show. And then we did one where Mary was home alone, but. She was with Millie or whatever. But that was the, what we called the withdrawal show. <laughs> was, that, was that Long Night's Journey in Today? Was that the title of it? Might have been. I don't remember. The titles used to be done after. We, that we were, they never rarely used the titles we had on the script. They would make up another title. Before that, we were talking about The Odd Couple. And, yeah. and I want to jump forward uh, for a moment to 1982 when uh, you executive produced The New Odd Couple. 
Um, how did that uh, come about for you? The odd couple was a terrific show. It was very proud of all the odd couples. Um, we never spit in the odd couple. They're a big tool of comedy as you drink. And you spit like Tony didn't like spitting, I didn't. So for 114 episodes, nobody ever spit on the odd couple. So in the last episode, we did a side thing, not on the air. They did a salute to spitting, what we call the spit takes. And uh, Tony and Jack and uh, Al Molnero did a thing that the audience loved. But um, the, uh, I'm sorry, you said the what show? The new odd couple. Oh, I, I'm blocking it. I'm in denial. I didn't do the new odd couple. The odd couple was my favorite. The new odd couple was a mess. Again, the business of television tries its best to get rid of the writers. It's happening again. Let's do reality shows. They don't want the writers. Do they dislike writers? No. It's just that normally men in suits don't understand writing. They understand everything else. They can't understand writing because writing is like magic to them. So if somebody's doing something they cannot do, it frightens them. I mean, it's tradition of the uh, first guy didn't want to fire. My God, put it out, it's the devil. You know, the wheel, oh, you round thing, throw it away. So they don't understand. When you don't understand, you crush is unfortunately human nature. So they keep trying to get rid of the rights. Now let's do survival, it'll be good. A millionaire, no rights. Then they tried to say, what do we need writers for? Let's take all the scripts of the old show, The Odd Couple, and make a new Odd Couple, and they'll use the same scripts. We don't have to, you know, you got to pay them something, but we don't have to talk to them. We'll just take the scripts and do So they had this idea to do the, um, the new, the black Odd Couple, Afro-American cast as The Odd Couple, because uh, uh, black shows were doing well. And I said, but, Hardcore is about two old Jewish men. You're making a show about two hip black men. It don't, the words don't fit so good in their mouth. And like all things, I think uh, you are talked into things sometimes for unnecessarily what could be good. And I remember the studio saying to me, we know you're busy, you don't want to do it. But they couldn't do it without my approval. The network wouldn't. Gary's not coming, why would we go? Gary will look it over, he'll check it out. And I said, I don't wanna, and they said, well, if we do the new odd couple with black actors, it means 75 black people will work as technicians, as cameramen, we'll make it a, a whole thing. And uh, that's why it would be the good thing about it. And that I couldn't refuse, all oh, right, I'll do it. And then the, they got, and there weren't so many black technicians, uh, so, but they got some, and there were guys, literally, who were working in car washes who came on the show. Well, after about seven episodes, they came to me and said, we'd rather go back to the car wash, because this is no good. And it wasn't. It just didn't adjust. The actors were trying. just didn't work. You just can't take one show and make it another show and keep the same scripts. because say, let's do a new show about two black guys who room with each other and write new scripts. So that was one of the more embarrassing parts of my career was the new art. But, you know, do it all in a career. Uh, because of uh, time constraints, I'm going to skip through a few other series of Barefoot in the Park, Me and the Chimp, and The Little People. Yeah. And Barefoot in the Park was a good show that starred black actors. That was a good show. It lasted a while, but uh, it was a good attempt. It was a white play, but we never did a... We did a white version that wasn't any good, a pilot. And then... Little People was the name of a show I did that was called The Brian Keith Show. Yeah, I figured, I always, usually you reflect on what your life is. And my, I had three kids and they were always sick, like me, for instance. I was, they were, you know, kids get hurt. So we're always at the pediatrician. So I said, I'll make it a show about a pediatrician. So we did The Little People with Brian Keith last a couple of years. And I did a couple of others. What was the other one I did? Me and the Chimp. Me and the Chimp, another embarrassment. Me and the Chimp, there was a great show called That Girl with Marlo Thomas, and they, on the show was a wonderful actor named Ted Bessel. But because Marlo was really the star of the show and Ted was the support, most of the time you saw the back of his head. You mostly saw, everybody knew Ted Bessel's haircut, because the shot was always on Marlo and he would be here, see? 
And so they said, you know, the guy who's back of his head is a pretty good actor. We should let him do something. So they wanted me to create something. And I don't know, Fred Silverman, a very smart man who did a lot of my shows, said, let's have a monkey, a monkey's do. An animal show is do. I said, I don't do animals very well. You'll do it. And so we did me and the chimp and uh, cast the wrong chimp, a crazy chimp. You think it's easy? You say, all right, ready, action. The chimp runs up in the raft. It's a half hour. Let's get the chimp down from the raft. He didn't want to be in a show. He didn't like the material. It was not good. So it's, uh, I always say it's now, me and the chimp is now on educational television under the title, Let This Be a Lesson to You. And uh, it didn't work out that way. Too good. But you meet nice people on it. Alan Rafkin and I became friends on that show. And Blansky's Beauty is another one. We, we started rolling them out in those days, and one was worse than the other. But some worked. What was Blansky's Beauties? Blansky's Beauties was another dream. I had, my mother loved dancing, so I thought I'd make a show about dancing. So I did a show about the chorus line in Las Vegas. And uh, it was on a few episodes, and then uh, Nancy Walker came into it and uh, tried to anchor it, but it never worked out. But uh, I liked it. It was good dancing and a lot of chorus girls, and it was pretty, but it was just catching on a little bit. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't have the time to do it. I was doing a lot of things. See, a lot of times you got shows, you don't have time to do them. So a lot of the creators that create the shows can't really take care. It's like their baby. They can't see their child. They can't do it. So it's no good. You feel bad, so I'd rather not do them than not be there. You know, you just don't want to let your name be on something. You want to help it. But uh, I liked Blancy because it was catching on, but then uh, um, they said, no, we'll do something else. Let's talk about one of the crown jewels in, in your work, and that is Happy Days. Um, how did that uh, come about for you? Well, <clears throat> around that time, earlier in the 70s, you forget what years there are. So I only remember when my kids, both my two kids I had born during my movie career with, uh, my first movie career, not the second one. Late 60s the kids were born and then we did Odd Couple. And after Odd Couple, you know, what I think is important in this life is to figure out if you're happy or not. <laughs> and if you're not, do something else. Well, my partner, Jerry Belson, was not happy with television. We had a big hit in Odd Couple. Not even such a ratings hit, but we won a lot of Emmys and nominations and this and that. And, uh, but he didn't like it. So he said he didn't want to do it anymore. And I started to um, think about, I liked it. I liked situation comedy. And I remember Carl said, write about what you know and this and that and to get more ideas. and. I wasn't a divorced man living in an apartment for five years with Art Couple, but I remember, hey, Landlord was about my youth, and I said, let me try that another way. And uh, the Happy Day saga is, I'm told, but never at the Academy here. Some young 18-year-old saying, what's Happy Days? Where is that? I have to find that. Um, two men who were influential in my career. One was named Michael Eisner, became big in his field. And the other was Tom Miller, who was a great uh, mentor to me. Well, I shouldn't say mentor. I think in life, if you're a creative person, you need somebody to come with you who says how great you are. If you're a person who can't say how great you are yourself. I was never good at blowing my own horn, as they say. Because my mother and father said, don't do that. So, uh, and Penny was no good either, but I could blow a penny's horn and my sister Ronnie, but there was nobody to blow. My. So Tom Miller came along and said, you're very good, I'm a producer, we'll be great. And so he and Michael Eisner wanted to do this show of nostalgia. And I was working on a show of nostalgia because we all realized that if you got a nostalgic show on the air, the reruns wouldn't look bad. Everybody was coming on with these reruns and they looked silly, a lot of them. It was, the, it was outdated clothing, everything looked silly. So we said, let's get nostalgic. And so we started, I was working on a, 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 a movie idea I had, and they were working on this. So they came to me and said, we want to do I Remember Mama. I Remember Mama was a show uh, on TV that was a very sweet show 
about, I, it was Norwegian or Swedish people running around. The name were Laws and Helstrom and things like that. And they said, you could write them. I said, in the Bronx, there were no Lawses. I didn't have them there. We had, you know, we had Milty and we had Vito. We didn't have no Lawses. So, well, you'll do. And then they said, you could do that. And I said, no. He said, you know what I could do? I can do the 50s. I meant to do it with a hey, landlord. Let me do it now. The real 50s will make a little outfit for the, the characters. Let's try the 50s. And they said, okay. And we did a pilot. And it was called New Family in Town. And uh, Marion Ross was in it. And Aaron Moran was in it. Uh, and Ron Howard I actually was in it. And... Uh, it didn't sell at all, and uh, they put it away. And like typical television, a lot of television is derivative. So luckily, George Lucas did a movie called American Graffiti, which he used my pilot to cast Ron Howard. He looked at it. Fred Roos was his casting director. And they found Ron. And then a great show on Broadway came out called Grease. And immediately TV said, look, the 50s are in. We got one of them. And they looked on their shelf, and there was a uh, new family in town. And Eisner was the four. Uh, he, he ran. Uh, he was at the network. And he said, come on, we'll do this. <clears throat> and uh, excuse me, let me have one drink, because this is a happy day story. Okay. okay. Continue. So in those days, when you sold the pilot, or made a pilot, forget, not saw it. In those days, if you made a pilot that did not sell, they put it on Love America style, or they threw it on during the summer because they wanted to make their money back. So New Family in Town went on Love America style, and nobody rose up and said, a oh, great show. They went, hmm, let's see now what about the tuber again? We like that one. So um, I think Dissolve, Grease comes out, Graffiti comes out, and say, Let's get, look at this. I'm getting drunk at the party. Uh, let's have a 50 show. So I redid the pilot. And this time we wrote three scripts because, you know, a lot of people like to know the process. Watch, you just sit down? No. We wrote three scripts. I got three stories. We wrote three different scripts. And then the network was going to pick one to be the pilot. So we were very brave in those days. And... Uh, for some reason, the censor went out for a cup of coffee because we did a show called uh, All the Way about a girl who supposedly went all the way. Of course, she didn't go all the way, but you knew that at 8 o'clock. But still, that was what it was about. And uh, we cast it again, and Ron Howard came back after a lot of uh, didn't want to be on it. And uh, the only thing he wanted was he didn't want to be a perennial kid. So he says, if I go on the show, you'll let it progress. I'll go through high school, I'll go through college, I'll get out of college. I said, yes, if we go that long from your mouth to God's ear. And we did. And he came on and we had Tom Bosley instead of Harold Gould was in the original. And Aaron Moran was still there. Mary Ross was still there. We brought in some characters. And then Michael Eisner went and saw American Graffiti. And he said, we need a gang. They got a gang in there, those bad guys. We need bad guys. I said, we got to cast a thousand of them. We got no bad guys. There's no room for it. There's where... So finally, I maneuvered around, and I remembered guys in my neighborhood. So I said, I got one guy who'll be the gang. The rest will come and go. One guy's the gang. And uh, we created uh, this character, Fonzie, who was originally called Matt. Is, is, we were going to call him Arthur Mascherelli. But... MASH was the name of a show, so the nickname MASH wouldn't work. So Bob Brunner, who was one of the writers, came up with the name Fonzarelli. We did something we could have short and then that was Fonzarelli, and we put him in, and I had done, see, a lot of times people understand you try something here, it doesn't work, you try it again over here. I played a character in Blancy's Beauties, I acted. I played a guy who worked in the casino in Vegas, who never spoke just wore dark glasses and walked around, scared everybody. And it almost worked, uh, the show didn't work. So I said, let's do that again. We get a guy who don't talk. It's always scary when a guy doesn't talk. So Arthur Fonzarelli was written, written just to point and do gestures and say very little. And I always remember one of my favorite actors was Gary Cooper, who said mostly yup. 
and became a gigantic star, which amazed me. So I said, he'll say little. And that's how we put this show together. And uh, the original writers on it was uh, on one of the episodes was Rob Reiner was on. He was a writer on our staff. We did a staff job there. And it went on. And uh, nobody else, and that was the first show I did pretty much created by myself. Nobody else really was creating it with me. And it went on and uh, slowly but surely did all right. Same thing happened to that as did Odd Couple after a few episodes of uh, one camera. And it was beautiful. It, we shot it like a little movie. And it was terrific. And the network got nervous. Now they went the other way. Originally, they were going, this, we got to be filmed, they said. Then they said, all right, you can do three cameras. Now, they, I'm doing film. And they want to do three cameras now. So we did it three cameras after a while. Because that's for laughter. It was because it was a show in which I was trying to create um, the fact that people had heroes in the 50s. The heroes were there, and, and you cheered the heroes. As the years went by, there was not a lot of cheering anymore. People didn't cheer anybody. Mostly they tried to say what was wrong with them, or they'd find some National Enquirer thing, what's there. So the heroes all had feet of clay because there were people coming around with axes chopping at the clay. Uh, my, I grew up, we had heroes. Joe DiMaggio was a hero, the Lone Ranger was a hero. So to me, Fonzie was always a combination of Joe DiMaggio and the Lone Ranger. And uh, the show uh, went on, Fonzie represented the gang, and slowly but surely people found it. And uh, it became a double standard show where the kids thought it was about them and the parents thought it was about their past. And so they watched it together. And part of my intention was to get a show that uh, everybody could watch together. My little kids couldn't watch Odd Couple, really. They, were too, they didn't understand it. But uh, once you have children and you take them someplace, you find that uh, you're a little bored. So I figured, do something about it. I mean, I used to take my kids to the movie and watch a raccoon lick a duck, and that was the end. Oh, I would doze off. I didn't like to watch that. So I said, there must be something we both must like. And so Happy Days seemed to fill that gap in the, the family situation of uh, watching TV together. Now everybody has their own TV. There wasn't so many TVs then. Let's talk a little bit about the casting and the characters. Uh, let's start with Henry Winkler. How was he cast? Harry Quigg, another mistake. I was wanted a tall Italian boy named Fondarelli to get away from the typical dark-haired Italian Al Pacinos and De Nero's. But uh, Henry came in, I, you know, from the streets of New York. I was looking. He was from Yale Drama School, and didn't want real Yale Drama School particularly, but an actor's an actor. And uh, he came in, he acted it, and then he showed me his. Uh, a Lords of Flatbush film. He was in Lords of Flatbush with, with Sylvester Stallone, where he played a hoodlum like Fonzie. And uh, he won me over. Tom Miller was the whole key to casting uh, Henry Winkler, and uh, there he was. He started out with no lines and slowly worked his way up. Let's stop there to change the tape. <laughs> 